morning, everyone. Welcome to Platwood Church. Those of you here in this room, and also a special welcome to those of you worshiping with us online. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here. Hi, it's me. I'm the pastor, it's me. It's a Taylor Swift lyric if you don't get it, so it's not just me trying to be obvious. Also that. Um, A couple of weeks ago, my 12-year-old son, seized by a moment of snark, as I was offering some deeply profound parental wisdom, raised an eyebrow at me and mischievously quipped, okay, boomer. (laughs) I am not a boomer, I defended, easily falling into his trap. I have since been informed that Gen Z, Gen Alpha uses the word boomer to categorize anyone older than them. He was not complimenting my wisdom. He was attacking my relevance. (laughs) Millennials, some of you fall into this generation, have endured years of unbecoming stereotypes now. Everything from critique of work ethic to technology obsession to whatever is wrong with the world today, millennials are the butt of many jokes from the older generations, an easy target for the boomers previously mentioned. As a zenial myself, one who bridges the space between Gen X and millennials, I now parent a Gen Z and a Gen Alpha kid, and I swear the next time I hear skibbity toilet or bruh in reference to myself in my own household, I might run screaming for the hills. Parents that are in these trenches with me, you, you know, you know. People of different generations experience the coming of age in the world in massively different times and in wildly different realities. Our values change, our language evolves, our possibilities and opportunities ebb and flow. And we tend to highlight those differences and tease and make fun. But in recent years, anyway, we've also seen a shift. Divides have grown harsher. We see it in the political sphere. We see it in the economic world, in media and entertainment. And like many other things in this modern time, we use our differences across ages to divide us, to belittle, to dismiss problems we don't want to deal with. The church as a body of people spanning the years from birth to death, holds sort of a unique place in this modern world. We are one of a few places in society where people of every age come together regularly, form community, and commit to a certain way of life and faith from zero to 105. This gives us the distinct opportunity to break from that rhetoric around us that sees difference due to age as detriment and instead be a place where we can genuinely learn from and care for one another across every era of life. Just as the world's greatest pop star has modeled in her record-breaking era's tour, every stage of life has something to teach us. Every era is a part of our becoming. And if we're curious and kind as we look backward or forward and around at one another, there is magic and beauty and truth and love in the eras of life. The study of human development tends to break down human life into stages by decades. That's sort of what we do naturally as well. The decade birthdays are always big milestones, right? We, we tend to look at our lives in chapters of tens. We think about, oh, when I was in my 20s, or now I'm in my 40s, or when I'm in my 70s. And the social sciences that we'll draw from in this series help us see more clearly that each decade comes with a particular struggle and with a particular gift. And if we can see one another across these decades with curiosity and care, we'll recognize that every era has something to offer and every era has something they need. So we begin today, of course, with our youngest friends, our first decades, ages zero to nine. Now you're in the room with us. Where are you? Raise your hand if you are between zero and nine. Yay, first decade, awesome. 
I'm going to share three quick Bible stories with you whose main characters fall into these eras. Um, The 10 to 19 is the second era. I forgot to call you out. 10 to 19, where are you? Where are my 10 to 19 friends? A bunch over here. We got others throughout. Okay, so we're going to cover some stories that hit both of those decades, all right? These characters are our examples and guides from Scripture as we dive into understanding and caring for the youngest in our midst. So from the Old Testament, I'll share part of the story of Samuel. Samuel was probably seven or eight. Where are my seven and eight-year-olds? Raise your hand. So Samuel's like right around your age, okay? He had been dedicated by his parents to serve God. So he lives in the temple with the priest whose name is Eli. Eli's getting old. His own sons are grown up, but they're a bit of a disappointment to him. They're going off the rails. They're not going to follow in his footsteps. And one night, Samuel lays down to go to sleep like he always does. Everything's quiet. Only the lamp of God is shining at this hour. The Lord called to Samuel. I'm here, the Lord said. Samuel hurried to Eli and said, I'm here. You called me. I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go lie down. So Samuel did. The same thing, exact same thing happens two more times. God calls to Samuel. Samuel thinks it's Eli's voice. It's not. Eli tells him to go back to bed. And then finally, the third time, Eli, the priest, figures out what's happening. He tells Samuel that the next time he hears the voice, he should say, speak. Your servant is listening because he realizes it's the voice of God speaking to Samuel. Sure enough, it happens one last time and Samuel does as he's been told. The Lord goes on to speak to him. And this is the first time that God has spoken to a human, to the people of Israel in years. The words that God says are harsh words. They're, not, they're words that are not great news for Eli the priest. So of course, Samuel gets scared. He's afraid to tell Eli what God said when Eli says, what did God say? But Eli reminds him that it will be worse if he keeps it in. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. He is the Lord, Eli said. He will do as he pleases. So Samuel grew up and the Lord was with him, not allowing any of his words to fail. All Israel knew that Samuel was trustworthy as the Lord's prophet. So hold on to the story of Samuel. And then there's the story in the New Testament of the boy with some snacks. He doesn't get a name. He barely gets a mention in this story. And yet he's maybe the most important person in the crowd that has gathered around Jesus that day. So I think we should give him a name. What's a good name for this boy? The boy with the food. Not Skibbity. His name is not Skibbity. Jerry? Did I hear Jerry? <laughs> Bob. Uh, Jerry was the first one I, first one I heard. We're going to go Jerry. Okay. <laughs> Jerry, the boy with the fish. All right. Jesus is with his disciples. A large crowd has gathered around them. And Jesus says to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered Jesus, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them just to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there's a boy here, Jerry, who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? You're probably familiar with the rest of the story. Jesus takes the bread and the fish that Jerry has offered, blesses them, breaks them, and distributes a snack to everyone who wants to eat. It's more than 5,000 people. Thank you. (laughs) So hang on to Jerry's story. And then finally, I'll tell you the story of Mary. Mary is a young woman. Scholar's best guess is she was probably 13 or 14 when this happened. She is engaged to be married to Joseph, as was custom in that time. And an angel appears to her when she's doing nothing but minding her own business and says, Rejoice, favored one. The Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel goes on to say that she is going to give birth to the long-awaited Messiah, the one who would save their people. Mary has questions like, how is this going to happen? I'm a virgin. The angel goes on to say that this is a holy thing that's happening, and that's about as much explanation as she's going to get. 
Mary takes in the news, the gravity of the situation, the significance of this announcement, the complication it introduces into her own life, and the trajectory it sets for the world and says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me, just as you have said. So hang on to these three stories, Samuel, Jerry with the snacks, and Mary, from the first decade of life and the second decade of life. They give us some lenses to see the children in our own community in these first two eras today. In the mid 20th century, Eric Erickson was a, psych a psychologist whose major contribution to the field was the first comprehensive framework for the psychosocial stages of a human life across the entire lifespan. He came up with eight. And many since him have augmented and adapted and contextualized his work, but his work remains seminal to this field. And in pastoral care and counseling, some scholars have taken these eight stages and applied them across the eight, give or take, decades of life. And that gives us, as the church, a robust approach to recognizing the needs and the gifts that each stage encompasses. In its simplest form of explanation, each decade of life has a primary virtue and a primary conflict, the gift they bring and the need they have. The virtue for our youngest friends, zero to nine, is hope. This surprises no one. <laughs> if you've spent three minutes around a child in this era, you remember something of what it is to hope. Parents of kids in this stage, grandparents even, you often relive a sense of hope within your own self as you watch your kids embrace the endless possibilities of all that can be. They model dogged persistence toward the outcome they believe will happen, whether that's ice cream after dinner, or a new puppy, or new friends in a new school year, or a safe and loving life at home. Jerry, with his fish and his bread, hands it all over to Jesus, fully confident that the outcome of feeding everyone will somehow be achieved. Never mind the cynical mid-30s disciples who are bogged down in pragmatics and disappointment. Jerry brings the gift of hope to the story. Children, as they come to receive the gift of bread and the cup at communion, have a different spark in their eyes than the grown-ups do. I see it. They come with hopeful eagerness that this delicious morsel means something wonderful. They're not worried about understanding it. They just delight in it. The thing about hope is it isn't built on wishes coming true. The outcome of hope doesn't have to be exactly what the child envisioned for the hope to survive. Hope is bigger than wishes. And in this first era, kids remind us how resilient hope has to be. My son Laz, at his ninth birthday party, was so hopeful that a certain friend would come. This was a newer friend, and he was hoping with all his heart that the new buddy would be there to meet his other friends, and I hadn't heard back from the mom. I didn't know her since the, the first invitation was sent, so I was super worried that disappointment might win the day if the friend didn't show. He never did, and I could see for a split second the disappointment on my son's face, but his hope for this day was bigger than that. His hope for his new friend was bigger than that. He had hoped for a great party and a new friendship, and so, he loved every minute of his party. And the next week at school, he told his new friend how much he had missed him, and they played together at recess every day for the rest of the school year. Hope is a desire for a future that we can't see yet, but it ignites in us a commitment to do everything in our power to bring it to reality, even when it's not exactly as we thought. Kids in this Era, raise your hands again so I can see you. Kids from zero to nine, where are you? Show me where you are. You are the ones who teach the church what it is to hope. You are the ones who show us where faith really comes from because you have so much of it. Jesus even says that you have something special that grown-ups tend to lose. He invited children to come and listen to him and play with him. He said, let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them. 
because the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like these children. That means that you have a way of seeing the world and what's important in it and who needs attention and love in the way that Jesus does. Thank you for sharing your gift of hope with us. As children age then into the next era of 10 to 19, another virtue layers on top of that foundation of hope. Where are my 10 to 19 year olds again? Got a bunch of you in the room, yeah. It's in this stage that humans begin to really activate our wills. When I was a kid, probably right on the cusp between these two eras, it was the time in history when bathrooms at home had books Magazines, you remember this, some of you, don't you? Some Reader's Digests, joke books, other light reading material for whatever amount of time it was that was needed. It's not like people took the phone into the bathroom. Good grief. <laughs> Anyhow, I have a core memory moment when I was sent into my parents' bathroom to get something from the medicine cabinet, which was really just the cupboard above the toilet. And I stopped short when I noticed a new book on top of the toilet book pile right there in front of me as I reached for the Band-Aids or antiseptic or whatever was a book called The Strong-Willed Child. <laughs> I don't remember anything else about that moment except that I paused, wondered about it, and felt pretty sure that whatever strong-willed child meant, it probably had something to do with me. <laughs> In the second decade of life, we are figuring out that we have a will. And more than that, when we put action to our will, we can affect change. And in healthy systems and safe environments, when we realize that our actions have impact, Tweens and teens develop and demonstrate the primary virtue of willingness. Willingness. We see an eagerness in this stage of pre-adulthood to try new things, to say yes to opportunities, to put energy behind a goal or a dream, to do what is asked when they understand that their action will matter. In Mary's story, this virtue rings out as she realizes the impact of her yes, her willingness. Her willingness will have on, not only on the world around her, but on generations to come. Her action will have impact. And she is the exemplar of how open and responsive young people in this era are to the invitation of the Holy Spirit. Their willingness opens their hearts. Most people who talk about deep experiences of God in their lives point to this era. Like Mary, this is the time when their hearts were willing to go where God was sending. We see our own students' willingness to serve here at Platwoods Church, on the AV team with PW Kids at Saturday Go Serve, because they have begun to understand that their actions matter in the world. You layer that understanding on top of the first virtue of hope and you see a powerful force for good starting to take shape. We see it in our kids that we just sent off to college. Parents, I have such big feelings for you in these weeks, especially if it was a first kid or a last kid or an only kid drop off. Just know that you've been prayed for. But you have these big feelings in these times because you see the enormous potential in your child as they activate their wills and their willingness in the world. It's beautiful, even in the scariness and the grief. There's a reason that most social movements throughout history have been driven by young people. It's this era that understands and reminds us of the power of our wills in action and that a willingness to offer ourselves towards good affects incredible change in the world around us. Tweens and teens, you are the ones that inspire us to reopen our hearts that have maybe grown hard to move us to the willingness to act when we have grown comfortable and complacent. Hope and willingness are the virtues, the gifts that our youngest friends bring to us in these first two eras. But as I said, each decade also has its own internal conflict too. For zero to nine, for our first era, that conflict is best characterized as trust versus mistrust. From day one, babies are figuring out what it takes to survive and who is going to help them do so. The first many times they get hungry, they believe they're going to die. 
until a grown-up has responded faithfully enough times that they start to trust that they will be fed. Every month of every year in this stage, a child is determining in new ways who is trustworthy, who is not, who helps them survive, who makes them happy, who makes them feel safe, who will stay or who will leave if they misbehave. Trust is the central need for this first era of life. And it's also when they learn what it means to be trusted too. How do they earn trust from parents, friends, siblings, and what are the things that break it? They're testing all these waters. There are a lot of layers of trust in Samuel's story. He already has a complicated childhood. He was living in the temple as an apprentice to the priest, not with his own family. But we see that he trusts Eli. He follows Eli's instructions and therefore learns to recognize the voice of God. And then in another moment when he's afraid, he doesn't want to be the bearer of bad news to Eli, feels like that might break his trust or maybe he won't be safe. Eli reinforces Samuel's trust by receiving the bad news, but doing so with grace, not with punishment or condemnation. And as a result, then Samuel himself learns part of what it is to become trustworthy. And the scripture goes on to say, all Israel knew that Samuel was trustworthy as the Lord's prophet. As our friends in this first decade of life are constantly navigating this journey through trust and mistrust, the best way that we in other eras can care for them is to be people they can trust. To see the gravity of this foundation that is forming in their lives and to help make it strong, to help their parents make it strong, to be the open arms of welcome and acceptance, real people who show them the fundamental belonging that we all have in God's love, no matter what. When a child pushes a boundary, intentionally or by mistake, we can be people of trust in their life who can say with love, that's not okay, but you are. If I were to put it to song, I might say, they need someone to be on their side even when they are wrong. As they age into the tweens and teens, the inner struggle becomes a little bit different. Their virtue, as we said, is willingness. Their basic conflict is autonomy versus shame or self-doubt. Anyone who has ever been a teenager or is a teenager now knows this conflict deeply. It doesn't need much explanation. In these years, you are constantly testing out, what can I do for myself? How much control do I have over my own life, circumstances, outcomes? Autonomy is self-governance. Growing and trying new things, taking on more and more responsibility for yourself, maybe also for others. Again, we hear Mary working out this exchange, uh, working this out in her exchange with the angel. Something is being asked of her, but in her autonomy, in her self-governance, she's not afraid to ask her own questions in return. She understands that this is going to have implications for her own life and for how others perceive her. She's making her decision for herself. The journey into autonomy is an exciting but a scary one. And sometimes along the way, it doesn't work. You make mistakes, you fail at something. And an instinctual response when that happens is often shame. You don't want others to see what has happened. You fear that people are looking at you in a way that you don't want them to. You feel like you at your core are not okay and you just wanna crawl into a hole. I think of the failed perm I attempted at age 13. Embracing my autonomy, yes, but then having to face my peers with the chaos that was my hair until it settled down weeks later. Shame can be a powerful force in the 10 to 19 era as our friends are growing into themselves. The greatest care that we can offer is to be a people of affirmation and respect. We can honor the incredible time of life they are in when they are perhaps the most open to the call of the spirit, to the truths of their own heart that they might ever be. And rather than downplaying or dismissing the struggles and the agony of middle school and high school years, we can hold them in high regard as the years of becoming. We can affirm the incredible things they can now do, 
the identities they want to embody, the courageous things they try, and we can be curious about what they find interesting. You, in this era, are learning how to be you. And above all else, we want your church to be a place where you never experience shame or doubt yourself. No matter how weird your perm looks, or how strange your body feels, or how much you're struggling on the inside, or how badly you failed the math test or didn't get on the team you wanted to, there is nothing about you to be ashamed of. You are beloved. (laughs) To put it all together then, our first decade friends bring to us the gift of hope of believing wholeheartedly in an outcome they cannot yet see. They call that hope out of us when life has grown weary and dim. They need from us trustworthiness and belonging, a place and a people where they know they are always okay. And our second decade friends remind us of the power of willingness in this world, of will put into action for greater good. They have the potential to spur us to action in faith when we have become stagnant. They need from us affirmation and celebration and guidance paired with unconditional love. A place and a people where they too know that they are always okay. In the words of a tortured poet, when you are young, they assume you know nothing but we as a church can do much better than that. We can assume that these first eras know a great deal, a great deal that perhaps we have forgotten. And we can celebrate the deep and sacred knowledge that our youngest friends share with us as gifts given from the heart of God. Will you pray with me? God, for our youngest friends, our earliest eras, we give you deep thanks. We celebrate their hope and willingness, and we remember that we all hold these virtues within us. Give us hearts to tend and care for the deep questions and struggles in every child's spirit. May we be their people of trust, their community of celebration, their spiritual home where they know they belong to you. Amen.